The Waters, written by Saffron Bryant, narrated by Michael Lee. Chapter 1 Riker wrapped his stinging hand around the hard weed, wire-like bristles dug into his palm, and blood trickled out between his fingers. He gripped the base with his other hand and heaved. The thin plant tore free, trailing a web of roots that clung to the rocky ground of the cave. Riker tossed the weed into a growing pile and wiped his hand across his forehead. He wore an absorbent towel around his head, like everyone else who lived on the hunk of rock in the middle of the underground lake. He couldn't stop himself checking for stray droplets every few minutes. It would only take one. He shoved the thought aside and focused on harvesting more rendweed from between the rocks. He had to make quota if he wanted to get paid, and by the waters, he'd get paid. If he worked hard, he might be able to save up enough to buy his freedom before he died of old age or the waters took him. Here she comes. Fagin stood beside Riker and tossed his own plant onto the pile. They gazed out across the misty water to where a small canoe with a single occupant skimmed over the surface. Others on the rocks near Riker and Fagin saw the boat and straightened. The boat weaved between stalagmites that thrust out of the lake, reaching for the rocks that hung from the ceiling. Glowing moss covered the roof of the cave and lit the scene in muted blues. She moves like a ghost, Riker said, watching Valda guide the boat closer. Aye, she's a born scholar. Could have given her da a run for his money, I reckon. Better her than me, that's for sure. Riker let his eyes slide past the water and shivered. I've heard she speaks to the waters, Fagin said. Don't be ridiculous, no one speaks to them. If anyone did, it'd be her. Aye. Riker tilted his head to the side. If anyone did. Valda lifted her oar out of the water. The boat slid forward another foot. Its bottom scraped on sand and stopped halfway out of the lake. Water lapped at the side of her boat and at the rocks that surrounded the thin wedge of sand that served as a dock. Two people appeared at the top of the beach and waved. Valda lifted her hand to them and tossed a rope from beneath her seat into their waiting hands. The boat rocked, but not enough to risk the water splashing. The people at the end of the beach heaved, and the rope pulled taut. They heaved again, and the canoe slid further up the beach. Sand scraped along its bottom, but the hungry waters fell behind. Valda stared down at the waters, meeting its gaze where most wouldn't dare. She respected the waters, but she refused to live in fear of them. They dragged the boat to the top of the bay, far from the waters, and only then did Valda stand and step out onto the bone-dry sand. The islanders stopped harvesting renweed and came toward her. They leapt from rock to rock, like the frogs that occupied the island with them. Valda felt a familiar glow in her chest at the friendly faces of her fellow drubs. If only she could take them all with her when she left. Valda reached into the boat and pulled out a heavy sack filled with drinking cans. She handed one water can and one thin copper coin to each person. They took care to keep the water inside hidden, only opening the valve once they'd covered the top with their dry mouths. Some climbed away from the beach, as if putting distance would save them if they spilled a drop. A useless step. Nowhere on the small island was more than seventy-five feet from the shore. A tiny collection of huts made from scavenged wood and dried rendweed roots clustered near the center of the island. How were they? Riker said, stepping out of the crowd. Valda handed him a water can and shrugged. The same as always. She turned and glared across the water through the mist. A sheer cliff of sharp rocks rose out of the water on the other side of the lake. At the top, a dim light of warm orange glowed. 
On clear days she imagined she could see the world beyond the cave, but today mist shrouded everything. Still, you won't have to worry about them for much longer, will you? Riker said. How much more do you need? A handful of coppers. The corner of Velda's mouth twitched. It wouldn't be long now. Do you think Tabby will be able to, you know? Velda's smile faded. She's doing her best. What else could she say? The Tabby could ride in calm water, but if a swell came, she'd sink and leave the drubs helpless. Ah, Riker said. Well, you were always going to be hard to replace. From his tone, Velda knew he understood. I suppose the waters take us all in the end, he said. Not me. Chapter 2 Valda tied a rag around her head. Usually the cool air of the cave meant that she didn't sweat, but taking people across the waters always made her nervous. People weren't like piles of rendweed. People were unpredictable and did stupid things, even if they didn't mean to. Sit exactly in the middle, Valda said, and don't move. Fern sat in the boat where Valda pointed and rested the baby on her lap. She didn't look at Valda, or the waters, her wide eyes still locked on her husband standing tall at the top of the beach. I wish he was coming with us, Fern said. I know. The man on the beach raised his hand. Valda tried not to think of them tried to see Fern and her baby as piles of cargo. She couldn't afford to get emotional. It would see them all dead. Besides, Fern was one of the lucky ones. Her family had saved enough for her and her baby to get away. Valda's heart fluttered. Soon she would know that feeling. Her parents and her grandparents had worked their fingers to the bone to save coppers, just so that one day Valda would be able to buy her freedom. It wouldn't be long now, a few weeks at most. Valda sat at the back of the boat and shoved her oar into the sand to push them down the beach. Getting the boat out of the water was much easier than getting it in. She pushed again. The canoe scraped another foot closer to the edge of the lake. Three more heaves and the front of the vessel hit the water and rocked. Fern gasped and snatched the sides. No. Valda slapped her free hand down on Fern's wrist, and the other woman ripped her hands back to her lap and the baby. Don't touch the sides. Do you want the waters to come for you? She'd told Fern a dozen times before they left, but people always did stupid things. The rest of the boat slipped into the water with a quiet splash. Valda paddled as fast as she could without creating any stray droplets. The sooner she dropped Fern and her baby off, the better. The cliff grew closer, emerging from the mist like a massive tombstone. Winding steps zigzagged up the face like a white scar on the dark rock. Valda took them straight and then curved right at an angle to the cliffs to avoid the whirlpool that often appeared to destroy unwary scholars. The baby sniffed. Valda's gaze flew from the waters to the baby's scrunched face. What's it doing? She's worried about Adar, Fern said. She can't. I know. Fern bounced the baby on her knee, but its face grew redder and its eyes squeezed shut. Fern hummed a short melody, but the baby's hands clenched into fists and it opened its mouth. Valda wedged the oar into a clasp on the side of the boat and tore the rag from her head. She lunged forward and slapped the rag over the baby's face just as it let out a wailing howl. The boat rocked beneath Valda's movement and the left side dipped dangerously close to the water. Valda adjusted her weight to correct but Fern leaned too far to the right and the other side of the boat dropped. Valda kept the rag over the baby's face with one hand and snatched Fern's shoulder with the other to keep her still. Valda corrected the boat's listing 
but didn't let go of either passenger. Valda met Fern's wide eyes. Fern nodded, and only then did Valda release her hold on the other woman's arm. White finger marks showed where she'd gripped, but she didn't feel bad. Fern would have killed them all with her frantic flailing. The baby howled and wailed, its voice muffled by the cloth. It twisted and turned, but Valda kept the material pressed against its eyes. It would only take one tear. I can do it, Fern said, voice shaky. Valda frowned. You can't? I know. Fern pressed her hand over Valda's and held the cloth against the baby's eyes. Valda sat back, eyes locked on the rag in case it slipped, but Fern held it steady. Valda let out a long breath and lifted her oar. The baby kept crying the whole way and its howls echoed off the cave walls and came back to them across the water. The noise must have disturbed the waters because they rippled and kicked at the boat more than usual. Valda kept that knowledge to herself and focused on taking them around the worst of the rips that would drag the boat sideways and dash them against hidden rocks. It felt like hours later that the small guardhouse at the bottom of the stairs appeared out of the mist. A lantern glowed by the door, and a wooden jetty hung out over the water. A bulky figure stood silhouetted against the light, but it stayed near the house and didn't step onto the jetty. Valda pulled the boat close and hitched it to the pontoon. Up you go, she said. Fern lifted the baby onto the jetty first, and then climbed after it. Valda kept the boat steady until they were out, and then vaulted onto the wooden planks. What's this? Shut that baby up, said the silhouette. Valda recognized Theodorix the gatekeeper's voice. They're buying their freedom, Theodoric. Oh, really? He stepped forward so that the light fell across his square face and wide smile. His long shadow swallowed Fern, Valda, and their boat. Fern gasped and drew back. Valda put a hand on her shoulder and propelled her forward. Valda had long ago gotten used to Theodoric's size. He and his kind, the Aeonas, towered over the drubs, all of them six feet tall at least. It was as though their bodies didn't know when to stop growing, like tumors. Fern reached a quaking hand into her pocket and pulled out three bags full of coins. She had to stand on the tips of her toes to drop them into Theodoric's outstretched hand. Although its crying had quietened, Fern kept the cloth pinned to the baby's face. Theodoric whistled. That's a lot of money for a drub. No games, Valda said. The waters are uneasy today and I want to get back. Theodoric chuckled. Very well. I'll weigh these and provided it's all in order. They can go on up. He disappeared into his guardhouse. What do we do now? Fern turned to Valda with wide, panicked eyes. I don't know. I've never been beyond. But you've taken others. You climb, Valda said, nodding to the winding steps and the tall cliff. And you don't look back. Find somewhere far from the waters. Fern stared up at the top of the cliff, face pale. Valda would have comforted her if she'd had anything to offer, but she knew nothing more of the outside world than anyone else. It couldn't be worse than living on the island, surrounded by the waters. Just enough, Theodoric said, coming out of the guardhouse. He tugged a large ring of keys from inside his pocket and used one to unlock an iron gate at the bottom of the stairs. Up you go. Now, Fern said. Unless you want to spend some more time on the island. No. Valda shoved Fern's shoulder, forcing her to shuffle forward. She hesitated at the gate, glanced back once at Valda, 
and then started the steep climb. Theodora clanged the gate shut behind her and returned the keys to his pocket. He grinned at Valda. Baby's da isn't going with them? You know none of us could afford to pay for three. Poor drops. Not two coppers to rub together. Valda scowled and stomped back to her boat. The drubs got coppers from Theodoric in exchange for rendweed. For years, Valda had tried to work out what the plant did, but Theodoric and the gatekeepers before him refused to say. All she knew was that it only grew on the island surrounded by the bloodthirsty waters. So the Aeonas made the drubs live there, risking their lives to collect it. For what? A few coppers that might one day be enough to buy freedom for someone? The whole thing was a farce, seeing as coppers weren't good for anything else. See you tomorrow, Theodora called. Velda pushed away from the jetty and lost herself in the sway of the current. Chapter 3 A week after Fern left, Valda returned from yet another journey to collect water from Theodoric. She placed the sack of water cans beside her boat and rummaged in her pockets for the bag of coins. The drubs came forward one by one and took a water container and a coin. Coming to the shack tonight, Valda? Riker said, as he took his coin. Yeah, she said. She didn't feel like making small talk with the other drubs, but if anyone could lift her spirits, it was Riker. Riker grinned and moved off to make way for another drub, Fagin, a quiet one. He bent and lifted a can of water from the bag. Valda held out his copper coin and her eyes fell to his hand. Ice cold filled her chest. She staggered back. Fagin frowned, and then his eyes widened as his gaze traced away from Valda to where he gripped the water can. A thin crack split the side and water trickled out. A single drop collected on the top of Fagin's hand. His fingers spasmed, and he dropped the container onto the hard rocks. The crack widened, and more water spilled out. People nearby gasped and scurried over the rocks like rats over a sinking ship. Valda stepped back as far as she dared, but the open lake lapped at her back. Fagin stood alone beside a growing pool of water that spread out over the rock. He gaped at it, and then at his wet hand. His panicked gaze fell on Valda. Help me! She shook her head, but words failed her. What could she do? He'd spilled water, and not just that. It had touched him in full view of the lake. She hoped the waters weren't feeling greedy. Usually they only took the one who'd spilled, but if they were feeling bloodthirsty. She stayed frozen, as if made of stone. She didn't want to give the waters any reason to notice her. What if it had leaked while she was on the lake? She would be dead a dozen times over. A cold shiver traced her spine, and the surrounding temperature dropped so that her breath turned to foggy clouds. Fagin's hands twitched. Don't run, Valda begged. It would only make it worse. The sound of trickling water came from behind Valda, but she didn't dare turn around. It grew louder, and a stream appeared beside her right boot. It was only little, two inches across at most, but it flowed fast and uphill. The stream skirted around Valda's shoe, up the sand and onto the boulder where Fagin stood. It met the spilled water around the broken can and flowed into it. The puddle grew more than it should have given the size of the stream, and screaming faces moved just below the surface. Fagin let out a choked cry and staggered backward. He turned and lunged for the next rock, but the puddle shot out a jet of water and it locked around his hand where he'd spilled the drop. The water became hard and jerked Fagin back. He stumbled and his foot landed in the growing pool, sending up a splash of water that coated his legs. He let out a stifled scream. Valda resisted her own urge to run. If she moved now, the waters would notice her. 
She had to stay still. Fagin's whole body trembled. Please, let me go. The waters crept up his legs and locked his feet in place. Pale faces peered over the tops of nearby boulders. Powerless. It's so cold. Fagin's teeth chattered as his skin turned blue. His lips looked lifeless, and his fingers had bent into claws. The water crept higher, washing up his abdomen and drenching his clothes. It dripped and trickled up his throat and edged onto his face. Fagin stretched his neck and twisted his head away from the water, but the tendrils reached up and touched the sides of his mouth. No! he yelled. Water trickled between Fagin's lips and then into his nostrils. He spluttered, coughed, and whatever he'd been going to say disappeared in a spurt of water that splattered across the nearest rocks. Valda's heart hammered. She'd seen the waters take people before, but that didn't make it any easier. If she could have ended Fagin's suffering early, she would have. But she couldn't do anything without drawing attention to herself and the others. Water snaked into Fagin's ears. His eyes bulged and water poured out around them. He'd become a fountain, with water spurting out of his eyes, nose, mouth. He jerked, clutched for his chest, and made a wet choking noise. His face turned purple and his eyes rolled back in his head. He flailed once more like a dying fish, and his body crumpled in on itself. He collapsed onto the rocks, but as soon as his flesh hit the ground, it burst outward and turned to water. It washed over the stones and splashed against the nearest boulders like a wave breaking. The people who'd been watching ducked out of the way in case a stray droplet should land on them. Valda had nothing to hide behind, so she stayed frozen in place and hoped. The water that had been Fagin settled into a puddle around his broken water can, forming a trickle that ran off the rock and back onto the sand, heading toward the lake. It passed within an inch of Valda's foot, but she didn't dare move away. It seeped and dribbled, leaving behind Fagin's water can but nothing else. Valda didn't move until the crash of waves on the beach behind her settled back to its usual rhythm, and then she sagged. They'd been lucky. At least the waters had only taken one of them. Chapter 4 Valda hurled the rope over the post and stomped down the length of the jetty. She carried the bag of water cans over her shoulder and Fagin's broken can in her other hand. Theodoric emerged from the guardhouse. Valda, wasn't expecting to see you again today. You bastard! She flung the can at the ground near his feet. The crack in its side widened. He jerked back, but when no water dribbled out, his expression darkened. What are you doing here? Blood pumped at Valda's temples, and her nostrils flared. I've told you a hundred times to be careful with the water cans, and every time you toss them around like they're unbreakable. Theodoric crossed his arms over his chest. I'd suggest you get back in your little boat and go away, Drub. No, you killed Fagin. I didn't kill anyone. You may as well have held the knife to his throat. Valda's pulse throbbed. You gave us a broken bottle. Did you do it on purpose? Was it a little game for you and your Aeonis buddies to see who would get the broken one? I'm running out of patience. So am I. We need water. Valda placed the bag of bottles on the ground between them. I paid you your water rations this morning. Yes, and one of the bottles broke and the waters came. Theodoric glanced at the dark water sloshing against the jetty. You're not entitled to more. I swear to the waters, Theodoric, Valda said. If you don't give us more clean water, you'll have an uprising on your hands. You drubs wouldn't dare. We would if you push us far enough. Valda's chest heaved. She could almost imagine it, the drubs rising up and breaking free of the Aeonis. But then the reality of the waters and the locked gate and the drubs' fear came crashing back down. 
She took a deep breath. Just to give us water, and next time be careful. Theodoric sneered. He glanced down at the sack of bottles and then at Valda. The corners of his mouth twisted and he snatched the bag and threw it over his shoulder. The cans smashed against each other. Valda cringed and rage boiled inside her. If those had been full, it would have been you the waters came for. Theodoric shrugged but didn't look around as he entered the guardhouse. Rage and guilt curdled Valda's stomach in equal measure. Her hands clenched into fists. Soon she'd be able to buy her freedom, just like Fern and her baby. Soon. Chapter 5 Valda handed out the last of the water cans and her heart fluttered. She took the thin copper coin that was her payment and held it up to the blue glow of the rocks above. This was it. It had taken all her father's life and his father's before him and all of Valda's life until now for her to have enough. But here it was, the last coin. Her stomach twisted at the thought of leaving all the other drubs behind, but she couldn't stay. Her father hadn't worked his hands to the bone as a sculler to save money for her so she could spend her life in the same way. He'd wanted her to have freedom, and she'd take it. That's the one, Riker said. Valda grinned. Yes. He engulfed her in a warm hug and Valda fought down the burn in the back of her throat. She hadn't cried once in her life, and she wasn't about to start now. Riker cleared his throat and held her at arm's length. He turned back to the drubs who stood in clumps near the beach. Attention, everyone! The drubs stopped working and studied Riker. Valda is going free! A wave of cheers washed over the island and people rushed up to clasp Valda's hand. Familiar faces and kind words swam around Valda but she found it hard to concentrate through her happiness, and before she knew it she was sitting on the boat with Tabby pushing them out onto the lake. Riker stood at the front of the waving crowd on the beach. Valda lifted her hand, but tried not to think too hard about their futures, trapped on the island. She couldn't afford to let thoughts of them stop her from leaving the island and the waters for good. Nothing could ruin her good mood, not even the way Tabby shoved the oars into the water so that the boat tilted with each stroke. Tabby's knuckles shone white where she gripped the oars, and she kept glancing at Valda. What is it? Valda said. You're leaving. Yes, I am. Valda squeezed the bag of coins. I'm not ready, Tabby said. Please, if you stay a little longer. No. Valda's reply came out sharper than she'd intended but she'd already imagined herself climbing the cliff to freedom. She couldn't turn back now. And besides, even if she'd spent another ten years training Tabby, the other woman wouldn't be ready. Not ready like Valda had been. Feeling the waters wasn't something that could be taught. You either felt them or you didn't. Tabby couldn't. She'd make a passable sculler, but she'd never know the waters like Valda did. One day she'd get caught in an unexpected whirlpool and drown, boat and all. You'll be fine. Tabby bit her lip and dropped her eyes to the bottom of the boat. Valda didn't have the heart to remind her to always keep her eyes on the waters. Besides, they were quiet today. Perhaps it was their way of seeing Valda off. They slid in beside the jetty and Valda leapt up, more full of energy than she'd been in a long time. Theodoric's familiar shape lumbered out of the guardhouse. What do you drubs want? Valda strode forward while Tabby stayed near the boat. My freedom, Valda said. She lifted the bag of coins and shook it so it jingled. What? Theodoric said. Freedom, open the gate. Afraid not. A cold, sick feeling spread out from Valda's chest and wrapped around her stomach. Her hand tightened on the coins. It was just Theodoric's sick sense of humor. He'd never failed to honor the freedom price before. That's not funny. Do you see me laughing? Open the gate. Sweat sprang out on Valda's forehead. 
but was absorbed by the thick band she wore. Theodoric was a bastard, but he honoured the price. He always honoured the price. Scholars don't get freedom. What? Valda faltered, and the hand holding the bag of coins fell limp at her side. Scholars don't get freedom. No, I've trained a replacement. Doesn't matter. You scholars are too valuable. What if your friend there gets taken? You're lying. Am I? You know of any scholars who bought their freedom? Valda thought of her father, but the waters had taken him, and his father before that, and his mother, and that was as far back as she knew. They die before they get the chance. Exactly. But I'm alive, and I have the money. You have to honour the agreement. Theodoric's expression darkened. His hand snapped out and gripped Valda's shoulder, pulled her in close so he could talk without Tabby hearing. Listen here, little drop. We let the occasional worker go free so that the others keep working. It's amazing what a little bit of hope will do. They're expendable, but you... No! Valda's fingers trembled. Theodoric made no move towards the gate. Sorry, drub. Better get back in your little boat. No! Hot rage filled Valda. She lunged at Theodoric with fingers bent like claws. How dare he block her way? She'd kill him and take the keys of his corpse, then all the drubs could get free. Her fingernail caught his cheek, and a red line of blood welled to the surface. Bloody drub! Theodoric snatched both her wrists in one of his giant hands and lifted her off the ground. Her feet dangled more than a foot off the rocks. She kicked and thrashed at him, but he held her out from his body so she couldn't reach. I'll teach you! He stomped to the side of the platform and dangled her over the water like a caught fish. Her blood turned cold, and she stopped struggling in case he dropped her. Listen very carefully, he said. If you were anyone else, I'd drop you right now and let the waters take you. Valda caught sight of the waters out of the corner of her eye. They bubbled and swirled beneath her. But like I said, scholars are valuable. Theodoric yanked her back and tossed her to the ground in front of the guardhouse. However, I'll be taking those coins as compensation. He snatched the bag from the dirt where Valda had dropped it. No! He tucked the bag into his jacket pocket and sauntered into the guardhouse. He slammed the door with a resounding crack. Valda lay on the ground and stared at the door. All her life savings and those of her father and beyond, gone, just like that. Her throat burned and made it hard to breathe. The backs of her eyes stung. Her eyes. Valda squeezed her eyes shut and curled into a ball so that the fabric of her coat pressed against her face. How could she have been so stupid? One tiny drop, and she'd have been dead. A warm hand landed on Valda's shoulder. Tabby. Valda shook her head, but didn't pull away from the rough fabric. She didn't trust herself. Not while her eyes burned and her throat closed so tight she couldn't breathe. What did he say? Valda's hands clenched into fists and her fingernails dug into her palms. Theodoric had taken everything and left her with nothing. She considered letting the tears flow. At least she'd be free of this hell. But she refused to give in that easily. Theodoric would pay. Valda drew a rasping breath. She pushed the rage and despair into a hard ball of hatred in her chest. Only when she was sure the tears were gone did she risk uncurling and opening her eyes. We're leaving. Chapter 6 Valda glared into the water the whole way back to the island. When they arrived, Riker rushed onto the beach. What's wrong? Why are you back? He called, over the splash of the waves on the sand. Valda hurled the rope to him, and he and the others hauled the boat up the beach. 
Rage burned through her and choked her voice. Riker appeared at her side and laid a hand on her shoulder. Are you okay? He said no. Valda's entire existence seemed to have shrunk to those three words. What? This doesn't make any sense. Did you have enough coins? Valda's rage snapped. Of course I had enough coins. Do you think I'm an idiot? He said scholars don't get freedom. Wood clattered against wood behind Valda. She turned. Tabby stood beside the boat, face white. She'd dropped the oar, and her lips trembled. What? Tabby whispered. Valda held a hand to her forehead. She'd forgotten Tabby was there. No, Riker said. That can't be right. Do you think I'd be here otherwise? Valda stomped away from the boat. People crowded around the beach. When they heard the news, their faces turned red and their hands clenched into fists. Valda slumped down onto a boulder and scowled across the water at the cliff and the guardhouse. She wanted to be alone, but the wretched island gave no chance of that. If she got her hands on Theodoric... But it wouldn't make any difference. She'd had her hands on him, but he was just too big. Even three drubs couldn't take on an Aeonus in normal combat. If they could, they would have revolted years ago. A shame the waters didn't come for blood. Or Theodoric would be dead. Valda's jaw clenched. She wouldn't do it. She refused to spend the rest of her life working to bring the Aeonus Rendweed. And what about Tabby and all the other scholars that would come after? Trapped. Valda leapt to her feet and the crowd around her went quiet. We've been slaves for too long. I say enough is enough. People muttered to each other and cast uneasy glances across the lake. What are you planning to do? Riker said. I'm going to climb the cliff. What? Others in the crowd gasped and drew back. I will climb the cliff. It's my only way out of here. Valda continued to stare across the water. The guardhouse blocked access to the steps, but legends told of people climbing other parts of the cliff. Valda would find a way. That would be suicide, Riker said. Everyone who has ever tried has fallen into the lake and been taken by the waters. Not everyone. What about Grix, the Strong, or Valian Waterborn? They're just stories, Riker said. Legends. Better to follow a legend than live a slave. You're really going through with it? Yes. Then I'm coming too. Valda's gaze fell from the cliff to Riker's face. What? You're not leaving me behind that easily. I thought it was suicide. Riker winked. Challenge accepted. Others in the crowd came forward. I'm coming too. And me. Me too. Others stepped away from Valda faces pale. Most of them almost had enough saved up to buy freedom, if not for themselves than for their children. She didn't resent them wanting to stay. Valda grinned at Riker. Together perhaps they would make it work. So what's your plan? Riker said. We build a boat, big enough for everyone. You heard her, Riker yelled over the crowd. Gather everything that will float. The people dispersed, leaving Valder alone at the head of the beach with one other solitary figure. Tabby, Valder said. Tabby swallowed and stepped forward. Can I come too? Of course you can. Only... Tabby gestured at the village. Don't worry about the ones that stay behind. The Aeonis will make sure they get water and supplies. The Renweed is too precious for them to ignore it. Tabby's shoulders sagged, and a weak smile crossed her face. Thank you. Valda nodded. But in the meantime, you need to keep sculling. We still need water and food, and Theodoric will be suspicious if I come back straight away. Right. Tabby turned and strode toward the village. Valda studied the cliff. Building a boat was one thing, but climbing up the sheer rock face was another. She'd examine it on her own before they all set out, try to see a clear way up. Perhaps they'd all become legends. Chapter 7 Valda pushed away from the beach, and the boat rocked under the weight of half a dozen people. The crowd on the island cheered. Valda turned and grinned over her shoulder. 
they'd had to settle for building a small raft which held seven people at once, but they decided that was better and less likely to draw attention than taking the whole island over at once. Valda would take the first six over, and they'd find a way up. Once they'd found it, she'd ferry people across. They'd waited until a thick mist rolled over the lake so they couldn't be seen from the guardhouse. It made it harder for Valda to read the pattern in the waters, but she knew them so well that it didn't matter. Riker sat in front of her, a grin plastered across his face. Tabby sat on the other end of the raft, ready to help steer if she needed to. The others bunched in the middle of the boat and flinched at every ripple. They'd never been on the water before, and Valda hoped they didn't panic. Panic would mean death. The water stayed calm as they skimmed across the surface and Valda took it as a good sign. She didn't have as much experience with the raft, and it bobbed low in the water. If the waters turned violent, she wouldn't have much control. But the waters gave little more than the occasional ripple as they paddled across the lake and came to stop a few meters from the steep cliff. It's so tall, whispered one woman. It's much bigger than it looks from a distance, Riker said. Valda eased the raft as close to the cliff as she dared. The water broke against the stones and sent up stray droplets that stood out against the rock. Deadly. I'll go first, Riker said. Valda's heart hammered. Be careful. She braced the raft, and Riker stood. He reached up high beyond the spray and gripped a protruding rock. He tested his weight, and then used it to haul himself up. The boat rocked, and the huddled group shrieked and drew closer together. Stay still, Valda said, eyes still on Riker. He pulled himself up another foot and looked over his shoulder. It's not so hard. His words gave the others courage, and one by one they stood and climbed the steep cliff. Valda's fingers itched to climb with them. She longed to get to the top and see freedom, but she had to guide the raft back and collect the rest of the people. Tappy didn't have the experience to control the unwieldy craft, so it left Valda with no choice. Riker climbed to three times his own height and paused. He leaned in close to the cliff and his chest heaved. Valda frowned. He wasn't even a quarter of the way up. If he was already tired, what would the weaker drubs do? Valda took rope from the floor of the raft and held it out to Tabby, who gripped the cliff with her left hand. Can you climb and hold the rope? Tabby nodded and hooked the coils over her muscled arms so they rested on her shoulder. Like Valda, years of rowing across the lake had made her strong and lean. Tie it down to something solid at the top and drop it down so we can haul the others up. I will. Valda's fingers danced along the length of the oar. How long would it take to ferry everyone across? Hours? She wanted to get started now, but she couldn't. If Riker and the others got stuck with no way up, then there was no point bringing anyone else over. She had to sit and wait until at least one of them got over the top of the cliff. Riker resumed his climb. He moved like a spider across the rocks, and his muscles bulged. Despite his obvious exhaustion, he made the act of climbing look easy. Valda allowed hope to flicker in her chest. This was it. The drubs would be free. They should have done it generations ago, but better late than never. And what do we have here? Said a voice from somewhere above. Valda jerked and a sharp tingle raced down her spine. Drubs being where they shouldn't. Valda squinted upward into the mist. Theodoric stood at the top of the cliff. He had something in his hand, but she couldn't make it out through the misty shrouds. Her throat went dry. How did Theodoric find them? What were they supposed to do now? Riker and the others stopped climbing, and their eyes flew between Valda and Theodoric. They expected her to do something, so she cleared her throat. Stand aside, Theodoric. We're leaving. He placed a hand on his stomach. Roaring laughter rolled down the cliff. I didn't know you drubs had a sense of humor. Heat crept over Valda's face, but at least he wouldn't be able to see it from so high above. 
You can't keep us like slaves anymore. Of course I can. You're drubs. I'm Aeonis. It's the way of the world. Not anymore. Yes. Theodoric brought the contraption in his other hand up, and a sharp crack filled the cave. Something whooshed past Valda's ear and slammed into the base of the boat. A crossbow bolt. It struck a thick piece of timber and stood upright, vibrating. Valda held her breath, expecting water to trickle up through the hole. But the bolt hadn't gone deep enough. All of you useless drubs, climb back down. Get into your boat and go home. Or I'll knock each and every one of you into the waters. Valda's heart clenched. He wouldn't. Of course he would. Riker and the others looked to her, eyes wide. Valda felt trapped in her own skin. It had been her idea to come out to the cliff. She'd chosen where to land the raft, and yet she was the only one not in danger of falling to her death. Come back! Her voice caught. She cleared her throat and spoke again, louder. Come back down. But, Riker said, now. Smart, Theodoric said. Tabby climbed down and stepped onto the raft. The others followed her. Riker came last. This can't go unpunished, Theodoric said. Valda's stomach clenched. Theodoric lifted the crossbow and pointed it down the cliff at Riker. No, Valda said. Another crack and a bolt whipped through the mist. A dull thud accompanied a strangled cry, and Riker let go of the rocks. His body fell like a dull weight and his limbs whipped out above him. Red bloomed across the top of his shirt, and bloody droplets splattered the surface of the lake. The waters seethed. Valda snatched her oar, instinct taking over. She shoved the raft away from the cliff. She only had time for two quick strokes before Riker's body hit the water and sent up a massive splash. The people on the raft screamed and ducked their heads. Valda kept paddling. The water bubbled and boiled around Riker and then spun. It became a whirling vortex that circled Riker's body like a hungry predator. The current grew stronger, sucking water into the whirlpool and down. Riker thrashed, his hands slapping the water but the force of the current dragged him down. His head dipped below the surface. His fingers made one more desperate grab, but the waters swallowed him. A thunderous sucking sound of waves and water filled the cavern. The vortex sucked more water into it and pulled on the raft, tugging it back. Valda heaved on her oar, but the whirlpool dragged them back, catching the boat in its current and threatening to pull them to the bottom of the lake. Tabby! Valda yelled. Row! Tabby gaped at her, and then at the water. Valda strained against the water using every muscle and rowing trick she had. Row! Tabby hesitated and grabbed her own oar. She plunged it into the water. Valda focused on her own rowing. She couldn't do anything more about Tabby. She just had to hope the other woman remembered what she'd been taught. The water tried to pull them toward the center of the swirling mass. It had a taste and wanted more. The waters were always the same. Valda tried not to think about that, or about the dark depths that loomed behind. It wouldn't help her. She leaned forward and heaved on her oar, in time with Tabby. The boat inched forward. She paddled again and again, and inch by painful inch the raft edged away from the hungry vortex. Better keep paddling, drabs. Theodora called. It doesn't look good. Let the waters take Theodoric. He'd killed Riker. Valda cut off her outrage at Riker's death before it could take root. She'd process her grief later, when she could make sure she didn't cry. She pulled on her oar and the raft surged forward. They'd broken free of the whirlpool for now, but if the waters were hungry, they'd keep coming. They had to get back to the island. She threw herself into the job, 
paddled as she'd never done before and hoped that Tabby was doing the same. She sent up careless droplets and the raft rocked, but she couldn't care about any of that. They were in more danger of a whirlpool appearing beneath them than of a stray droplet thrown from Valda's oar. The island drew closer as the cliff shrank behind them. At first people gathered on the beach and cheered, but as the boat drew closer, their claps died. Throw the rope, Valda yelled. Someone behind her moved and a moment later the rope sailed over Valda's head and into the crowd. People grabbed the other end and heaved. Valda kept paddling until her oar hit sand. She let it slip from her hands and sat, oblivious to the surrounding crowd, the questions, even the hands that tried to haul her out of the raft. Riker was dead, and it was all her fault. Chapter 8 Valda sat on top of a high boulder and glared across the lake toward the cliff. Water lapped at the bottom of her rock, too far away for any stray droplets to hit her. Tabby's boat grew bigger through the mist until it reached the sandy beach. Valda strained to hear Tabby and the others, but she didn't take her eyes off the cliff. He refused, Tabby said. Valda pursed her dry lips. Three days without water. Most of the drubs sat with their heads clutched in their hands. Theodoric was punishing them for their attempted escape, as if Riker hadn't been punishment enough. A low groan ran through the drubs at Tabby's news. She'd paddled over every day to ask for water, and every day Theodoric refused. Valda hadn't expected anything else, but she admired Tabby for trying and for paddling out over the waters on her own. Valda refused to go. She couldn't bring herself to look Theodoric in the eyes, to ask him for anything. He'd shot Riker and let the waters take him. Valda would never forgive him for that. She swallowed in a vain attempt to wet her parched throat. If Theodoric didn't give in soon, the drubs would die. He had already killed one of them. Wasn't that enough? Of course not. The Aeonis always wanted more. Her father had once told her about an Aeonis that had treated the drubs like real people. He'd manned the guardhouse when Valda's father was just a boy, and apparently he'd given the drubs extra rations. Valda had stopped believing in that fairy tale a long time ago. Valda. Tabby's head appeared to her right. She climbed the rest of the way up the rock and sat beside Valda. Theodoric said something else. I don't care what that animal had to say. He'll only give the water to you. Valda's hands clenched and her nails scraped the rock. What? That's what he said. That bastard. Valda's throat closed over. Theodoric wanted to gloat. He wanted to prove to Valda once and for all that he had total control of her life. She'd tried to disobey him, and someone had died. Now if she did it again, all the drubs were in danger. I don't see any other way. Valda said nothing. She underestimated Tabby, and felt a small flicker of guilt. Tabby was scared of the waters. Any sane person would be. But at least she faced her fears. And now, when Valda brooded on a rock, Tabby risked her life to get supplies for the people. Valda, I'll go. Are you... If it's the only way, I'll do it. I won't kill everyone for my pride. He wants to hurt you. I know. Valda stomped to the edge of the rock and climbed down to the beach. The sooner she got supplies, the better. Do you want me to come with you? Tabby said. No, I better see him alone. Valda shoved the boat off the sand and let it glide out across the waters. Instead of paddling straight for the guardhouse, she took her time and skirted the edge of a wide set of rapids. Despite the danger, she always thought best when out on the lake. 
Her father always said it was because the danger took away meaningless thoughts and left only important ones. He was probably right. He usually had been. She let the splash of water against the side of her boat soothe her raging anger. She had to go to Theodoric and ask him for the supplies. They'd both know she was only doing it for the other drubs. But it was the act that mattered. She looked up at the sheer cliff and felt a burn in her throat. They wouldn't climb the cliff again. She couldn't bear to have another soul on her conscience. But they couldn't stay slaves forever either. She pointed the boat toward the guardhouse and paddled with long, firm strokes. There was no other way out of the cave. The smooth ceiling came down below the surface of the water in all directions except the cliff. That meant they had to get past Theodoric, and she already knew she couldn't beat him in a physical fight. What did that leave? Her mind kept turning over that same question all the way to the jetty. She tossed the rope over the post and marched towards the guardhouse. Theodoric emerged and crossed his arms over his chest. Look who it is. You know why I'm here. Need supplies to keep your fellow drabs alive? So? Apologize. What? It's your fault that drub died. It's your fault I had to climb up to the top of the cliff. And it's your fault the other drubs got the stupid idea to escape. Apologize. Valda tensed. All of those things were his fault. Theodoric's nostrils flared, and he looked ready to storm back into the gatehouse. Just a few hours ago, she'd told Tabby she wouldn't let her pride get the drubs killed. So what was she waiting for? I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. I said I'm sorry. That wasn't so hard, was it, little drub? Theodoric patted her on the head with his massive hand, making her brain rattle inside her skull. It took all of Valda's self-control not to lunge at him. He turned and swaggered into the guardhouse. He returned a few seconds later with a sack of water cans, which he dropped to the ground with a loud clatter. Valda tried to snatch the sack before it landed, but it slipped through her fingers. She cringed as the cans smacked against each other. I told you to be careful if you- Ah! Theodoric held up a finger. Don't give me any reason to take them back. Valda snapped her mouth closed. She lifted the bag and studied each side for any sign of leaking. She didn't see any, but she placed it at the other end of the boat and sat as far away from it as she could. Theodoric chuckled and his stomach wobbled. Valda glared at him and paddled toward the island. She kept one eye on the sack the whole time. If even a single drop escaped while she was in the middle of the lake, she'd be taken. The boat slid up onto the sand and the drubs helped haul it out of the lake. Water? Have you got any water? They crowded around her boat and some reached for the sack of water cans. Wait, Valda said. She stepped between the people and lifted the bag out of the boat with one hand. A part of her expected a cascade of water to fall out of the bottom. Nothing. She lowered it to the sand and peeled the end of the sack open. Cans clicked against one another, but she didn't see any telltale sparkle of spilled water. Still, she wouldn't risk another death. She reached in and pulled out the first can. She checked it over, turned it upside down, and watched for any leak. Only when she was sure it wasn't broken did she hand it to the nearest drub. The crowd muttered. Some pushed to get to the front. What are you waiting for? We're dying of thirst. Don't be stupid, Tabby said. She's checking for cracks. Do you want to be taken like Fagin? Silence descended over the gathering and they stopped pushing to get to the front. Valda handed the last bottle to a waiting hand. Thank you. Valda looked up 
and Tabby's face swam into focus. They were just thirsty. Valda nodded. Tabby wandered off, leaving Valda alone on the beach. She took the last water can from the sack. Her dry throat burned and her tongue felt swollen, but she didn't drink. She carried the water can to a lone rock. Everything about her life revolved around water, in one way or another. Water sloshed against the sides of the can, much like the lake sloshed against the beach. If only the waters offered help instead of death. Chapter 9 If I don't come back in three hours, take the boat and go to the guardhouse. I don't understand, Tabby said. What are you doing? Something that will probably get me killed. But why take the raft? It's harder to control. Exactly. I don't want to leave you stranded here without the boat if I don't make it back. Of course you'll make it back. What are you doing? If you tell me, I can help. No, I have to do this alone. If it doesn't work, then so be it. Valda wouldn't risk Tabby's life or anyone else's. Not again. She shoved the bulky raft out onto the water and let it rock beneath her, getting a feel for its balance. It felt like riding a solid tree trunk compared to the sleek boat, and she had to work three times as hard to make it move. Valda's heart fluttered high in her chest, but she refused to listen to her own voice telling her to turn back. This was it. Her one chance. If she failed now, she'd be dead, so nothing else mattered. She crossed the lake far faster than she'd intended, and the jetty loomed into view. Her fingers trembled as she threw the rope, and for the first time in many years, she missed the post. She yanked it back onto the raft before it hit the water and forced herself to take two deep breaths. She threw the rope again. This time it hooked on the post. Valda climbed up onto the jetty and hoisted the bag of empty water cans up with her. You're back early. Theodoric hollered from the door of the guardhouse. You're not due more supplies until tomorrow. And what happened to your fancy boat? Valda stopped five feet from Theodoric, still on the jetty. I've come to make a deal. A deal? Theodoric laughed. What could a drub like you have that I'd want? I want freedom for me and all the others. In exchange, I won't kill you. There's that sense of humor of yours again. This is your last chance. Theodoric's smile faded. Look, Drub, you've been nothing but trouble from the beginning, just like your father. If you weren't scullers, I would have gotten rid of you a long time ago. But that Drub you've been training is getting good. So don't think you're not expendable. Get back on your little raft and go away. Your choice. Valda reached into the bag of water cans and pulled out the one on top, the only one with anything in it. The water inside sloshed as she lifted it over her head and hurled it at the ground by Theodoric's feet. His mouth fell open and his wide eyes followed the can's arc until it smacked against the hard stone ground. Valda's heart clenched. If the can didn't break, Theodoric would kill her. If it did break... The waters would take them both. The water can smashed against the rock with its bottom edge, and a crack opened along its side like a twisted smile. Water spilled out, dribbled down the side, and wet the stone underneath. Some of it flicked up and landed on Theodoric's boot. What have you done? Theodoric shrieked. Relief flooded through Volda and her shoulders sagged. The waters would have taken her eventually. Better she take Theodoric with her and give the others a chance at escape. Beneath the jetty, the waters seethed and frothed. Waves rose up and splashed the stones of the small outcrop on which the guardhouse stood. You won't take me! Theodoric bellowed at the waves. He turned and ran toward the stairs up the steep cliff. He grabbed the bars of the gate and shook. 
They rattled and clanked but stayed closed. He fumbled inside his coat and pulled out the rusted keys. Felda stood, rooted to the jetty. She didn't have much hope, but maybe, just maybe, if she stayed still, the waters would leave her alone. She had nowhere to go anyway. The temperature around her plummeted and her breath turned to fog. The cave echoed with the noise of splashing water. Theodoric jammed the keys into the lock, but his fingers slipped and the keys fell. They jingled as they hit the rocky ground. A wave, larger than the rest, rose from the water and surged up onto the rocky outcrop. It washed across the ground and collected the fallen water can. It reached further like a hungry mouth and lashed against the side of the guardhouse. Tendrils split off. Some raced along the jetty toward Valda and others reached for Theodoric. His face went pale. He let out a strangled scream and tried to push through the metal gate. It didn't move. The waters raced up his leg, soaked his pants, spread across his shirt. Trickles spread up his neck and wet his cheeks. He screamed. Water poured into his mouth and his screams descended into a choked gargle. Valda stayed firm. She'd accepted as soon as she'd decided on the plan that the waters would take her. She couldn't stand so close to spilled water and not get taken. But she wouldn't scream or run like Theodoric. The waters could have her, but she'd go down with dignity, knowing she did all she could to save the drubs. Theodoric coughed and spluttered and water poured out of his mouth. His eyes widened and rivulets streamed out from around his eyeballs. The tendrils on the jetty reached Valda, but they paused near her feet as if waiting. She didn't move. Theodoric reached for his throat as he collapsed to his knees. He stretched a clawed hand toward Valda and then fell face forward. His body exploded into a wave of water that rushed around the guardhouse and dribbled off the side of the outcrop. The tendrils near Valda hesitated and then withdrew, joining the main mass of water that poured back into the lake like a small waterfall. The water surged and churned, but they didn't reach onto the land. Valda staggered and fell to her knees. She leaned forward and stared at the ground. Every trace of water was gone, taken back to the lake. She trembled. Part of her couldn't believe she'd survived and expected the waters to surge back at any moment. It took five full minutes before she could bring herself to stand and stagger toward the guardhouse. She leaned against the doorframe and something caught her eye. Theodoric's keys glinted on the ground beside the gate. Valda snatched them and clutched them to her chest like a lifeline. Her hands quaked, but she managed to unlock the gate and hurl it open. Twisting stairs that led to freedom, her legs twitched to run, but she couldn't. Not yet. She tucked the keys into a deep pocket and shuffled down the long jetty to the raft. Every muscle in her body quaked from relief, excitement, and fear that it was all a dream. By the time she got back to the island, she'd felt as though her arms might give out. The drubs stood on the beach waiting and surrounded her with questions as soon as they dragged her boat out of the water. What happened? What's going on? The water seethed. Was that you? Valda grinned out over the crowd and held up her hands. They fell silent. We are free. What do you mean? Look what happened the last time you said that. Valda reached into her pocket and pulled out the keys. This is different. This time, we will walk out with our heads held high. The End this has been a reading of The Waters, written by Saffron Bryant and narrated by Michael Lee.
For more amazing books and audio, go to www.saffronbryant.com.